everybody. Thank you for having us. I'm a little bit sad that we're the third female speakers that you've had, but I'm hoping that you've only had two speakers before us, so then that means <laughs> it's quite good odds so far. So, um, so thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, probably um, indulging a side of us that um, love to talk about a subject that we can't stop talking about. Um, it, we talk a lot about culture, but we talk about engagement, so we'll interchange those a little bit as we go through. But um, we hopefully we can share a little bit of sparkle about what we think makes a good culture and a few sort of top tips um, that we can share with you from some of the experiences that we've been lucky enough to have um, since we left Red Bull and also from Red Bull. So um, I just wanted to start with, let's switch this on, a little picture. So if you look closely, you might recognise two quite familiar looking people. Yes, that is me and Carla, dressed as a cow and a wolf, head of brand and head of HR. I never thought they had it so good at the end of their career at Red Bull, but there we were standing amongst a uh, team of people um, clapping at a man standing on top of a castle turret uh, waving at us. Um, and why you might say that? Well, my next picture, again, another jumping shop. We loved a jumping shop at Red Bull. This is the company of Red Bull uh, running one of our events um, called X Fighters. Um, and this event was run not just by the marketing team or by an outside agency. It was run by every single person in the company. So they would all freely give up their weekend, whether you worked in the finance team or operations or you were based in the field and you would come, get dressed up in some silly costume and you would work that for free. And we used to say that it was like being part of a cult. And it really was. Um, for those of you who ever watched the programme recently about Lego, they talked about it being a family. It was a family, <laughs> but it felt much more like a cult when you were in it because you didn't realise how much of that you were so engrossed in it. And we used to say if you cut people, they would bleed a bit of Red Bull. And that's because people came together, brilliant people, lots of very young people, and they absolutely felt passionate to go above and beyond every day because they believed that that was their business. It wasn't an Austrian guy's or a Thai guy's business, it was theirs. And everything they did had a significant significant impact and that's true and this is what it felt like so there we are again hidden Carla's <laughs> a bit more at the front there um, but part of an amazing team um, and it was quite a departure for Carla and I because we hadn't come from this background of working for a crazy brand that let you be um, yourself every day. We came from quite corporate backgrounds. So, um, so I worked for Hasbro and Polaroid, which are very, you know, dinosaur companies, big shoulder pads, lots of offices. Um, Carla worked for even more shoulder pads and offices, Barclays. And we then were immersed into this business where suddenly it was all about a love of people and a love of brands. And these companies um, that are here, they talk so much about cultures. You can imagine at Barclays, uh, particularly now, it was all about culture. How do, we, how do we build this amazing culture of engaged people? But they just talked about it and actually you, you couldn't feel it until you stepped into a company like Red Bull and then when we left after 10 years to set up Fizzbop Bang we knew exactly what we wanted to do and that was <laughs> to share that secret of how you build amazing cultures because we believe it's fundamental to business success. So here we are at Fizzpot Bang now um, and uh, I think our name um, explains really what we try to do with other organisations and what we try to help them with. So we passionately believe that um, to have a really successful business you need to get two things right. So you need to get your fizz right which is all about your brand, your identity, who you stand for to your customers, your suppliers, your consumers. What is your kind of I guess persona and identity in the external market and what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. That's obviously really important, but you then need to couple that with your pop. So that's all about your culture. So who are you? What do you stand for? What type of people do you have in your organisation? What is the DNA of make, what makes you special and unique and different from your competitors? Why would people come and work for you? Uh, and we believe if you can get those two interlinked, so you can get people to live and breathe your brand and your identity through the culture, that's where the, you get the amazing results. And I'll talk about what those amazing results are in a minute. So our mission is pretty simple. Um, it's to um, make the nation whistle on their way to work. Um, and um, that is um, something that we came up with on, not on a day like today, actually. It was on a grey and rainy uh, Tuesday in January and, and we were kind of bouncing to work and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get every single person um, to um, really whistle on their way to work? And it's, for us, it's not about happiness. There's a lot of chat about happy cultures and making sure that everybody kind of comes to work with a smile. For us, it's about coming to work with the determination and resilience um, and and excitement about the challenge that lies ahead. So we know that there are bad days, um, but if you can get, um, if you can create a culture of people um, that are up for that challenge, that is where you will find that you have a winning business. 
So uh, we couldn't do it alone. Um, so we started um, back in 2012. Um, it was just Imogen and myself um, sitting at a desk kind of going, so what do we do now? Uh, so I'm sure <laughs> you all have done that. Um, and with our kind of our big mission um, and our big kind of um, outlook on what we wanted to change in the world of work, we knew that we needed to have a team of people, of like-minded people, and to build a culture to help us achieve that mission. So at the moment, we're at 11. Um, 11 is a really important number. Um, it's obviously the number of people in a football team, for those of you who are football fans, but it's also a cultural tipping point in an organisation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So we're going to cover some um, case studies, but we, we're going through it as well as helping other organisations. So hopefully we can give you an insight from our side as well. I think it's just fair to say that it would have been a lot easier if we'd have stayed at two people because we'd have probably <laughs> made more money straight away and we wouldn't have had the pains of growing and, and owning a team again, which we forgot was what we left behind at Red Bull. And you, when you're in that world, you forget how difficult it is. Um, but if we really subscribe to our mission, which is to make the nation, the nation, then we have to grow and we really want it to be more than the Carla and Imogen show. We want it to be an idea that really for want of a better phrase, has a bit of wings and then catches on. So the business is really important to us. So why bother? Why are we here really talking about culture and, and engagement? Um, for us, um, it's always been a topic that I've been passionate about personally being in HR, but it, it, it's always been talked about, but it's always been seen as a bit of a fluffy thing up until um, probably 2009 when the government commissioned a big um, report to look at companies that were bucking the double dick recession and um, what they were doing um, to enable them to be successful despite the economic conditions. And what they found was that um, those companies that were doing it had really high levels of engagement, so they had a great culture. Um, so there are some stats here which I'll let you read, but the, the things that I think are really important from, from this side um, are that if you get engagement and your culture right, you have people who will go way beyond what you ask of them. So they will be the people who will go that extra mile, they will try harder, they will um, sacrifice things in times when you really need them. Um, they also act as ambassadors when, when they leave, which is really important. Um, any of you that have a marketing agency, you know, word of mouth is so powerful. Word of mouth is also powerful in terms of your employer brand. So if you've got people who have worked with you and had a great experience, um, they will also, you know, talk about that experience and, and help other people um, kind of find you, as it were. Um, also, engaged individuals come up with their best ideas at work. So 59% of engaged individuals say they bring their best ideas to work. So they are the people that are having those ideas day in, day out. Disengaged people, only 3%, so it's a huge difference. Um, from a company side, we also know it affects the bottom line. So this is the bit that's quite interesting, and, and I guess when I was at Barclays, back in the early 2000s, um, engagement was a big topic, but nobody really took it seriously. It was kind of a lip service thing, because actually we need to deliver our business results. We don't really care about the fluffy stuff, and we're just setting up a group of people to do that so we can carry on doing what we do. But Businesses that focus on their culture and getting it right and in getting their people engaged um, grow fast, twice as fast as their peers. And crucially, the bottom line performance of those engaged organisations is four times that of those that don't have it. So there's a business side to it um, and you know, a reason for doing it. So I think, um, you know, given all those statistics and those people who love a bit of statistics, there's an amazing amount of information out there that's quite compelling. It would be easy to think that, um, you know, culture is an easy thing and that we should just all do it. And there's a really interesting reason why I think people don't do it. And um, we get asked an awful lot, but cultures build themselves, don't they? Like we put our heads down, we do the work, we become successful, we build a great culture. Um, but we actually believe that is fundamentally wrong because all the great companies out there have got a really clear idea that what their culture is going to be. It's very planned as much as their business is planned. There's a great um, quote, which I'm probably sure most people have heard, but it's um, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I think that's a really interesting notion because I think that notion is that you need to make sure that for your business to be vibrant um, and to be successful, it's no good just having an amazing product or an amazing business plan. You have to have the culture alongside that so that you're nourishing your people alongside that as well because ultimately they're the people that are going to deliver the work for you. 
Richard Branson, we'll talk about him a little bit, whether you love him or hate him. And we're in quite a privileged position because we've worked with an awful lot of companies. I think it's fair to say mostly bigger companies than, than you guys. We're going to try and share a few case studies just to share a few learnings. Um, but we're also going to talk about ourselves a little bit. Um, and these are sort of similar things that we hear from a lot of people, um, from small companies and from big companies. And there's an interesting dynamic because small companies want to learn from big companies in terms of efficiency and structures and frameworks. And big companies want to act much more like startups again. They want to understand what it is that they can get from their people because millennials nowadays want more than just a job. They want something that's a purpose and they want more, more autonomy than ever. And suddenly big companies are realizing they don't have that anymore because they had that whole I'm going to tell you what to do and everyone's going to do it um, plan. Um, equally things like um, we're going to have a ping pong table, we're going to be awesome, we're going to have a ping pong table and then suddenly it's like we need to have a little think about things first before you do that. So there's a whole load of reasons why I think um, people have that perhaps gets in the way sometimes of building culture. So what we know in terms of the growth of an organisation and, and its culture, are there some um, key cultural tipping points um, that we wanted to um, share with you today so that you can think about these and where you are in this, your stage of growth, um, but also be aware that they're quite painful, these tipping points, and it's okay, everyone goes through them. Um, the thing is to know that that's where you are and also know kind of what the next step is to kind of help you get through them. So, um, as I said, 11 is an important number. We're there at the moment. We're in between these, feeling this pain. So, for any of you at that size of uh, agency, we, we feel where you are. Um, but I guess um, up to 11, um, your people and culture, it's a really kind of tight-knit crew. Everyone's in it. Everybody knows everybody. Um, you tend to have recruited people who are your friends or you know or you've worked with. So, actually, there's this sense of uh, we're all in it together. We've all got one, you know, common um, purpose and direction and we're, the engagement levels tend to be quite high at this stage. But we say you still should start thinking about your values uh, even at this point and it might feel like it's actually, actually we just need to get on and deliver great work um, but you do need to when it's beyond just one or two of you to have a clear articulation of what is what, what bottled up is you? So what is the essence of you as a um, company, an agency, whatever it is? Um, so it doesn't mean that you need to sit in a room and write them yourself. We'll talk a little bit about that later and how to do it. But actually just thinking about what are the things that sound, keep you um, uh, different from your um, competition and that you want your people to be doing to kind of, what's their motto as it were. Um, skills. So at this point, you've probably got a, a, a team of mainly generalists um, or you know at certainly at least a, 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 a proportion of those who muck in so one day you might be out doing a big pitch and the next day you might be doing some filing and admin because there just isn't enough of you to have all of that specialist support um, so it is much more of a kind of collegiate feel um, also in terms of office environment you may have an office you may not you may all work from home you may all work from cafes it kind of doesn't matter as long as you're communicating at this point so actually um, you know the Google Hangouts its one of the things that we do um, really regularly, but it's about having that flow of, thing, of, of communication, which is really important at this stage. So as you move beyond the size of a football team, um, 11 to 35 um, is your kind of next tier of cultural tipping point. And um, this is a stage where actually as um, an owner or you know, the founder or director of um, an agency, um, your role stops being involved in being, in being involved in everything and you really need to start taking a step back, which can be really difficult because it's your baby, it's your passion. Um, this is where it requires good leadership um, and having a clear vision of where you're going and making sure that everybody understands what that is. Um, but it's also the point where you start to think about perhaps having a more of a formal structure, um, processes, starting to bring in some of those efficiencies that you, Imogen said that small companies tend to want to learn from big companies, but don't let them stifle you. But it is that kind of starting to grow up phase. And then from a skills perspective, um, it's also time where people start recruiting outside of their immediate network. Um, one of the dangers of recruiting in your immediate network is you tend to recruit people who are like you because you like them, because they have the same skill set and they have the same strengths. And that kind of works here. Over there, actually, what you're doing is building a business which needs a different set of strengths and different set of skills. And that will be different for you know, any um, agency. So it's working out um, for you, what are those um, skills and strengths you need? What do you already have? And how can you fill those gaps? And that's really, really important um, because actually that d diversity of opinion is what will help you to grow and, and experience. 
Um, and this is a stage where you need to really start thinking about some people support. And I use people um, kind of in place of HR because HR is, having been from dead. HR, I was like the angel of death or something <laughs> at Red Bull. Um, so so uh, um, how can you um, get the people support that you need. It doesn't mean you need a full-time person, it just needs somebody in your organisation who is mindful of that. Um, engagement, um, particularly millennials, um, is hugely driven by learning and de development and growth um, and feeling that you're invested in and that you can take ownership of your own development. So actually having somebody who's going to champion that within your business, whether it is doing simple things like you know sharing within your um, in your own group of people, skills that you have, or bringing in some outside support to give little bite-sized tasters, or using your clients to inspire you. It's about having that as a, 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 I guess, a benchmark that is something that is really important and not just a nice to have when you're not busy. Um, and then finally, environment. So this is a stage where actually, um, you know, in the world of technology, it is changing, but you will have to start thinking about how do we meet up at points face to face. So you may have an office, you may have a co-working space, but if you don't, how do we get people regularly together so that we still we do have that contact, so that people um, have that culture um, and have that experience of each other. And then 35 plus, um, so this is where it starts kind of um, tipping into the more, I guess, um, grown up world of um, uh, business life. And actually, as a, an owner, you may walk into your office um, and not know everybody anymore. You might not know their names because actually you've gone from all these people around the table, someone else has recruited them the right skills, but you don't know everyone. So this is where it gets really important to, you've bottled up and distilled what you're about in the early stages, but how do you now share this with people more formally so things like induction around this is the way we do things here so um, in terms of mindset and how you recruit people that's really important that you think about your brand and your values um, but allowing people to be part of that so they can make intelligent decisions on your behalf and you're not the one having to play a policing role you're actually empowering them they know it skills um, Again, more diversity of thinking. You're probably going to start thinking about people from bigger organisations or different, um, a different stage of their growth in terms of um, the agency life cycle and bringing them in to help you through that journey. And it might be that you have outside support and mentors, it's, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then this is where it, it, it really is worth thinking about appointing a people person. Um, and we would say, um, spend your money here um, if you're going to do it don't have an office admin support at this point you need someone who's going to champion and challenge you as an owner um, to put people at the forefront and we've seen lots of businesses where they fail purely because they've done that and they still believe that everything is in their head um, and they're not prepared to be challenged and um, I guess open that up to to involve their people and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on yeah yeah is, is that because you were talking about classic HR role? Um, yeah. But that's evolved quite a lot. Are yeah. there like particularly, um, like particular skill sets or something like new learned skill sets, or like you find HR people from maybe yeah. other areas that you wouldn't traditionally have looked for? Yeah. So I think it's it's quite varied. Um, so for example, I went into a Red Bull with financial services background, which is quite weird uh, we've got a lot of agencies that we work with where they have brought people in from actually s s where it's been successful because we know people where it hasn't been successful and they've brought in somebody quite junior where it hasn't been successful and actually they've become an admin person who's been booking courses and actually can't then stand up to the owner to have a challenging conversation about this is the way our people should be going where it works really well is where you have a person with a, a challenger mindset um, who's probably come from a slightly bigger organization but wants the autonomy to um, and creativity to create something within your business and I think that's yeah. it's not necessarily um, I guess background but it's mindset um, and, and also L&D background yeah. is where it's at now so you can get lots of very generalist HR people who can do a lot of different things but a really decent L&D person that's is where it's at because they can do yeah. some of the HR stuff as well they'll want that autonomy from being running the show and helping that business but if you get a really switched on clever young HR person then you know that's that's what you need because then they'll set the world alight as long as they can stand up to you 
So it's all about gumption. We had that on our site. It's all about gumption. If you can hire for attitude and they've got a bit of that L&D side of it, that's definitely the right way because, like Carla said, I'd probably say that's the number one thing to take away on all of this. If you're going to take an HR person on, don't give it to your office manager or, or an assistant because they will never stand up to you and that's where you waste your money. So. And on things like contracts and the kind of basics of HR, you can outsource that or you can get somebody relatively cheap to do that. This is, this is I guess, the part of HR that we're not... That's what people see as HR actually is kind of I need someone to do the contracts and make sure I'm legal that stuff just has to happen this is about what is my people strategy how am I going to find the best talent out there how am I going to develop them how am I going to make people want to come and work here rather than the competition that's how you grow um, and then in terms of environment um, so at this point I imagine most of you know um, people will have an office of some sort and the really important thing here is making sure that um, the environment that you work in does reflect your values we go into lots of places where you know they have these amazing values and these amazing people and they're sticking a ping pong table in the corner because they think that that's what they should do but actually if creativity is one of your values how do you bring that to life how do you have you know areas where people can co-collaborate and how can you um, have space where people can go and be inspired and all that kind of stuff um, it sounds sounds really obvious but it's the one thing that people just go we just need an office space and we just need a desk um, actually make sure it reflects your values and then pod style working just because you're getting big it doesn't mean you've all got to be in one place actually um, some of the biggest organizations are now trying to create that community again so if it doesn't work for you you can still have little pods it's about that community and then bringing people together when it's needed so there are some more tipping points after this. Um, so 50, 100, and 250, really. Um, but we thought for the purposes of today to kind of concentrate on where the majority of you guys are. So, yeah, cool. So that's kind of like a bit of context as to why it's important. If you weren't convinced before, hopefully you are a little bit more now. We just thought we would share with you our sort of top tips about where to get started. Now, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you will be doing some of this, if not a lot of this, hopefully. Um, but um, this is just our opinion and what we probably tell people most and when we get go into businesses, what we have to get started on. So this is kind of our thought process that we go through whenever we work with any business. So we thought we'd share that with you so hopefully you can learn some stuff for your own businesses. So so firstly work out who you are it sounds like a really obvious one I'm sure as a, a group of um, business owners it's something that you spent a lot of time thinking about um, but it can so easily start at the wrong end of the spectrum and so often we meet with people who have worked out really well what their brand is in terms of how they share that in their marketing messages to their customers or their consumers but they haven't really worked out some of the fundamentals um, that makes up what a company's attitude to life is we call it our fizz so it's like what's your purpose your story what is your personality and your essence um, that makes you you and the decisions you're going to make because they're the things that will inform both what you share it's but also um, what you bring to life internally and what your people believe of you. So getting those things really clear is really important to do quite early on because as you grow, that message gets thinner and thinner and harder and harder because you can no longer sit around a table and tell them easily. And um, we can't count the number of times that people have said to us, well, I know what our vision is or I know what I'm about and I can see the person sat next to them who's that HR person going, I don't think our people do, but you <laughs> clearly do. So it's about being really clear so that as you grow bigger, it's really clear as that gets warmer watered down what that means to people. Um, and, you know, not to <laughs> lean on a point too much, um, but often we get told, well, which of these are really important to put in place to build a culture? Um, you know, is it about having processes or um, what we dress like or having flexible working or a cool place to hang out? Or I've seen a few people have happiness managers, which is totally fine. It doesn't matter. None of these are more important than others. The most important thing is that it's authentic to you. So whatever that middle bit is in terms of your purpose and what you're about, and your attitude has to drive what it is that's authentic to you because then that's what builds your culture. What are the things that are really important to you and how people behave? So um, forget about what other people do. Think about what's important to you and what's going to drive those behaviours so that you can sustain that as you go bigger. Um, and this is going to be the biggest company that we talk about, of course. Um, we can't, because um, we're a Richard Branson lover. Um, Virgin is just such an easy one because don't forget, every massive company started tiny at one point. Um, 
Richard Branson, I'm pretty sure, started as a one-man band because he was frustrated about British Airways and the service that he gave. Um, but he created something which was um, translatable. He was very clear about what that meant to him, what his attitude to life was. And as his businesses um, grew to like 400 different businesses across 30 different categories, he made very sure that they tried to translate that as clearly as possible to what he originally intended to. And they have what's called the red thread, which I think is quite a nice idea. So it runs through everything they do. And, you know, I'd love to have this, this problem, but um, he won't um, grow a business beyond 250 because he believes that's when culture significantly change. So this red thread through everything that he does flows through all of his businesses, but it started just as that idea about what, what was Virgin about and what were we here for and what, what was our purpose and our attitude. Um, and a nice example is heartfelt service. So um, they obviously have an awful lot of people sitting on frontline call centres in different Virgin businesses. And he realised that people get really burnt out. And I'm sure probably many of you have heard that one of the ways they deal with that is they give people unlimited holiday which for a lot of HR people terrifies the shit out of them because they're thinking everyone's going to be on holiday. But actually what they found is people didn't take more holiday than they normally did, but they took holiday freely when they really needed it to be refreshed because they were having a really tough time being on some quite difficult jobs. So it suddenly boosted what he was trying to do through his, through his red thread. And once you know who you are, then you need to know where you're going. And again, it sounds really obvious, but um, that vision should be where you're going. But it should be an inspiring vision that people get behind and people can um, get emotional and um, engage with and want to follow you um, in, that, in that vision. So we just want to share an example. Um, <laughs> of a vision that may have felt a little bit impossible about 10 years ago. So this is um, the South Liverpool Homes Group. Um, they're a housing association in Liverpool. Um, and 10 years ago, they were the um, bottom ranked housing association in the whole of the UK. Um, on came board a new CEO and with her team, she created a vision that was to turn the UK's deprived, most deprived neighborhood into paradise. Look at that picture, it looks pretty <laughs> darn impossible. But what she did was she set the bar really high and she got people really excited about the possibilities of the future. Um, and then 10 years on, actually for the last two years, they've been ranked um, the, one of the top places to work in the not-for-profit sector and they're now the top um, housing association in the country. So it is possible. Set your, set your bar high and involve your people in that aspiration. Um, so you kind of know who you are and you know where you're aiming, um, then it's about setting values, which can be quite a difficult thing to do. Um, we say create values that create energy with your business, because that is the purpose for them. It's not to tell people why you're going to be a great business to work with, although that is a byproduct of it. It's to drive behaviour. Um, so we just want to do a little task, because we quite like everyone sitting there thinking it's boiling hot and have had a few drinks, um, <laughs> which is perfect. So we just want you on your own for a couple of minutes to just think about a time when you're at your best. It can, be, it can be in work or out of work, but you've achieved something, you're in the flow, you thought, yeah, I've done a really good job there. Just have a little think about that. I just want you to then share that with the person sat next to you. Everyone's looking at me with dread. Um, and we want you to just share what, what were the things that helped make it happen? What was it that drove you? What was the environment? What were, what were all the elements of it that made you feel like you were at your best? And we just want you to share it and see if you can find some common themes. Okay? We know we'd have a bit of music now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just sing. We'll just dance. <laughs> So the reason why we say in or out of work is because sometimes in work you can get really bogged down by what you're trying to achieve or the fear or that it has to be results orientated. Um, but most of you hopefully will be sharing things like this. So um, there's a lot about the challenge. Um, it's not easy. It's about overcoming something you thought you could never do. Um, but it's the sort of journey of getting there. There's a lot about um, being in it together and achieving stuff together. There's a lot about being excited. Um, and passionate. Um, these are all amazing things that come up when you start thinking about um, what is it that makes you at your best. So why is it that most companies in this country have values like this? I'm going to have integrity, respect, I'm going to be innovative, 
um, because they don't really mean anything. They're lovely, they make you have great intent. They're not bad in terms of you as a company and the, your moral values, but your people as you grow bigger will want to know what sort of behaviours they should share. And um, if you look at um, uh, the definition of energy, it's about momentum and flow. And these values are just, they're just one dimensional. So when you're thinking about your values, think about what it is that really drives you, that is purely about you and what you're trying to achieve in your vision, and what is it that you want to manifest as your attitude. And they should inform everything that you do as a business. So um, how you celebrate success, um, what sort of things you're going to do. Is it about people wearing crowns for the day, which person I would love? Or is it about <laughs> just saying thank you or having a Friday beer um, time is it you know how are you going to do that that reflects you as a business um, they should re um, reflect your environment that Carla said so um, you know we sound slightly down about ping pong tables we've come from a world of ping pong tables but that might be totally right for you because that is what you want to be playful like that's what your values understand for you so that's totally right for you um, it's how you tell your story what is it that really gives that extra dimension to your personality um, it helps you affect your decisions are we going to do this or are we going to do that because I know what my values are going to tell me how I should behave um, and how do I put processes in place so that they don't affect what our values are, which is Carla, Carla's first job when she joined Red Bull, is how do I put process into a crazy world like Red Bull, <laughs> where we are so values driven um, and we don't affect that because that's still really important to us. Uh, and then when you get there, you need to know your people and it might sound obvious and, and probably at your sort of up to 11, you, you probably do. But um, it's very easy to think that you know your people. And, and I just love this, this stat where HR people think that this is what millennials are. So they think actually they're only 1% loyal. <laughs> actually, millennials see themselves as 82% loyal to their employers. So rather than thinking you know what they think, um, get into their heads. So treat it like you would treat your consumers. Ask them, you know, we spend, spent a lot of time when we were at Red Bull um, understanding what our consumers were and how we were gonna target them and how to get the best out of them, involve them in our brand. And, and actually, I then was like, why don't we do that for our people? We just, you know, nothing had existed. So ask them, involve them, treat them like your consumers and understand what their needs are. And then you will be able to do things that build that culture that they want as well. And then really importantly, and probably one of the hardest things um, as an owner is um, to let them own it and build it. It's not about you anymore as you grow. Um, so you, you can tell them um, what you want and you can tell them your vision and your values. Um, and it is really important to communicate that culture and to reinforce that and to role model it. But if you only tell them it, they're just gonna see it, which is nice, but they won't actually do anything about it. If you show them the culture um, and invite them to be, you know, kind of uh, visually see it, they'll feel it. But if you invite them to be part of it and to share it and to grow it and be part of that growth, that is when you create brand ambassadors. And those are the people that will take your business to the next level. And it's the hardest thing because suddenly it's not just about you or you and your co-founder making those decisions it's about allowing the people to be involved in things so when we talk about values involve them in coming up with your values when you're thinking about your strategy and where you're going obviously you know you will have a view but open it out get involvement where you can because then they will you won't have these difficult conversations around challenging conversations they will help you to solve those problems for you and they will grow and build that culture and then um, as someone growing a business, you're clearly focused on growing your business and your numbers and where you're going and what you're going to achieve from a growth plan perspective. But it's equally as important to think about your people plan when you're thinking about your business plan. So some of the things that we would suggest thinking about in terms of that people planning piece um, is who you recruit. So as I said earlier, it's time to start thinking about not just recruiting people who are like you, recruiting people who are different to you, um, but also recruiting people who are better than you. So that's one of the scariest things you think, oh, I don't want someone who's gonna be better than me because they might challenge me and I'm the boss. But actually, it is so much better to have a team of A players who are gonna be pushing you and experts in their field. And when you go and win that piece of business, you say, I've got a brilliant, I've got a team of people who are better than me who are gonna deliver that. So don't be scared of that. that how a business will grow and evolve and challenge and they will lead it in that uh, in, on their own um, plan a structure before you need it so um, I said there's a tipping point around 11 and um, you may have a, 
um, agency um, quite often have a structure before that, but actually having um, a group of people who are all sat in a bedroom um, doing lots of things um, and coming up with great creative ideas. You need to be thinking about what's that next phase that you're going to and what's that structure, who's your next recruit, and keeping your eye out for that next brilliant person. Um, Hire the best people person. We talked a little bit about that. Don't give it to the office manager. When you're in the point of thinking, I need to get some, uh, a people person in there, it's not about the processes at this point. You can outsource them. You can give them to the office manager. It's about actually challenging and growing your people and having a strategy of where am I going to find the top talent? How am I going to grow them, develop them? Grow and develop from the start. It's very easy to say we're going to do that when we've got some money. It doesn't cost lots of money. It doesn't have to cost lots of money. There's lots of online solutions. There's lots of ways you can use your contacts to provide training. Um, you can run short bite-sized sessions. Um, but it's about keeping people feeling that they're inspired and learning. And then deal with monsters quickly. Um, this is something that um, you know a monster can have such an impact on your culture, um, and your culture is only as good as its lowest common denominator. And I remember when we first saw Daniel talk, he um, uh, challenged people to think about two things when it came to their people, and it's always stuck in our mind. I don't know if you knew this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> would would you um, uh, would you miss this person if they left? So if they resign tomorrow, would you miss this person? So that's one thing. And then actually knowing what you know now about that individual, if they left, would you re? recruit them and that's a really big test because quite often because somebody's been with you the start you think that's the way they are that you know we've just got to work around so and so because they're a little bit of a monster and but they're great in other aspects and yes that's is kind of the case to a certain point but it can have such a damaging impact on the rest of your culture particularly as you grow um, so stamp out those um, bad behaviors really early on um, you can tell she was still in HR a little yeah <laughs> stamp them out yes <laughs> stamp them out um, yeah <laughs> Um, and then um, we just wanted to share another case study with you. Um, so MVF are um, a global customer acquisition uh, marketing agency and um, they've grown from five people in 2009 to over 250 now. And we work with them actually, um, we've been working with them for the last year. Um, they um, invested in the top people person that um, I think I've ever met, she's amazing. You basically, if you've asked me what you need as a people person, you need her. Um, she came from ASOS um, and um, I imagine she cost quite a lot of money but she has totally revolutionized the way that they do business. So they have grown their talent all from within um, and they have had um, a team of great generalists who have been um, good at what they do but actually she has recognized severe gaps in their team and said we've got the capability we just need to be able to do it. So alongside her we've basically built them a leadership a year-long leadership um, development program to bring all 45 of their managers um, to equip them with the skills and the confidence and the learning and the inspiration that they need to be brilliant. Um, but she also really champions people being the focus. So they, you know, kind of their values and things that they offer their people are just, you know, very simple but lovely. Um, but what they do is they get their whole 250 people together every year to do their business planning. So last weekend they were out in Ibiza, I think, uh, which is all, you know, you don't have to do that, but it's about having people in the same room, feeling that they're involved, feeling that they are part of the future of the business. And that means that they can give them a huge amount of accountability. They expect so much from their people because they give them so much um, scope and autonomy to, to, to help shape that future. Cool. So um, we recognize we have um, use case studies of bigger companies. I mean, I could say, don't forget every company started small, but we thought we would finish um, rather terrifyingly <laughs> with a lesser known company like Fizzpot Bang, um, <laughs> because um, we thought we could share with you some of our perspective in terms of life and a few ideas that we found um, work. Um, but like I say, growing pains is just part of day-to-day -day life as well. So, um, so uh, we, got, we, are, we were asked relatively early on what were our values and we were like, oh yeah, we haven't got values, brilliant. <laughs> so we were like, quick, we need to have values. And at that time, we think we were three people. So we were like, right, we need to start thinking about what is it that makes us tick because um, you know, this is really important stuff. We're telling people to do this and we're not actually doing it ourselves. So as our team grew, we started to bring it together and refine it a little bit. And our number one, so we have a pact, 
our number one is practice what we preach. That came up quite quickly after <laughs> we realised we didn't have values. Um, so it's really important if we are um, sharing ideas about how to build engagement and culture that we still practice what we preach a little bit because otherwise we're simply not actually doing some of the things. We're just teaching people what we think works. So that's really important to us. Um, always be authentically you. That means that um, you know we were very clear that we wanted to be something different to what other people are offering. You can imagine there are an awful lot of very big management consultants out there um, doing million pound projects telling you this is the way to do it and we felt that by being authentic to ourselves and sticking to that we would always make a difference and that's really important so we'll always say what we think based on what we believe is right. Um, and, and just to say, we work with an awful lot of very corporate, corporate people like the NHS who try to drag you down a route because they want to bring you in to be different and then they change their mind halfway through. So that really gets tested. Um, curiosity makes us tigers. So a learning culture is just part of who we are. We don't want to ever stay stand, stand still. We always want to um, keep on top of things. Um, never pretend that we know everything um, because we're always learning and things are changing and people are changing and expectations are changing. So that's really important if we're going to make a difference. Um, and and probably one of our first actually was two heads are better than one so when Carla and I first set up um, I think actually if I was honest setting up a business on my own would never have happened I probably would still just be thinking about it but I luckily met someone who is completely the opposite to me and challenges me every day and that way of working is how we've carried on through our business so every team is made up of two people who are very different who have very different strengths who work on projects and we have this like 80 20 rule so if I'm working on a piece of work I get to about 80 percent I've kind of had enough I'll pass it on to someone else who finishes it. It takes a bit of trust and a bit of leap of faith but it works it means that every project is so much better because it has two different people with very different perspectives working on it so that was really important to me and we snuck, we snuck in a little extra <laughs> one um, whilst we started to get a little bit bigger and that was spirit and I think probably as fellow um, agency owners that's something within all of us but um, through good times and bad times it was really important that if we were going to practice what we preach and try and get the best out of people we really needed to keep our spirit so what that means in practice I'm just going to shamelessly show lots of pictures <laughs> of us doing stuff um, is um, you know we put buddied people up so every workshop every project gets a, a buddy um, and they and based on strength so they're always very different um, we um, so a couple of little ideas we we obviously want to learn and because you know we're a culture of learning people love a good good um, a good book so at Christmas we gave everybody a book that was very specifically aimed at what we knew they loved um, we run business planning all together um, and we share with them our sort of thoughts for the future but then we ask them in return we do a wish and a wand um, so we say um, what is it you wish for in the next year and what is it you're going to commit to and what, what are you going to wave as your wand to give back to us so everybody feels like they have a stake in, in what they're going to do and be part of that um, we're trying really hard to build a community and this is even more terrifying sharing this with a bunch of people who are much more digitally savvy than I am but um, actually this is something we've learned just by off chance so we thought maybe we needed something really technical and really because we're all very remote working but actually whatsapp works pretty well for us you know we have a group that we don't run we're part of um, and our team share everything on that so they share successes birthdays and when people are about to go in and do a really hard pitch or a really tough client um, you know setting up meetings um, all sorts of things it's just the way that we chat to each other on an informal basis and that works really well and it's free so I'm pretty sure everyone's going to tell me now how horrendous that is but you know that works really well for us and is free and this is a really nice example of why I think our community is working quite well so this was our, our Christmas present back to us one of our team members made a notebook with all our little names on it which I thought was quite nice so that just shows that they feel like they're part of a community because we didn't ask them to do that we do have a couple of tech things that we do so obviously Google Hangouts is kind of just a million times better than Skype so we use that as much as we possibly can and um, when we're not actually together um, and we use an app called Mativi now there's lots of people solution apps out there we quite like Mativi it's not that expensive um, and it gives you a really nice simple look at what people are doing so all they have to do on a Friday is write what were my three highlights of the, of the week what were the, my three challenges and what am I going to focus on next next week and it pops into everybody's inbox it shares with them it does a little motive you have to show how motivated you are so we can keep a check on what generally is happening in the business and it's brilliant because we do it as well you have to be really honest it's not just about work it's anything so you know you've had a tough week you've got to be honest and share that but it just suddenly opens up a little bit about what's going on in an informal way and that works quite well so I'd encourage you it doesn't have to be my TV but that just happens to be one that we quite like 
And finally, as I said, spirit in good times and bad. So, you know, we try to <coughs> roll with the good and the bad. And it's really interesting you talk about the good times and the bad times. You know, we have our fair share of that as well. So the good times are get-togethers and planning and coming up with new ideas. And we um, have a curious, what we call Curious Minds program, where we just get together like once a quarter and someone picks a subject they want to know more about. And we try and work out how we're going to do that. We have one this morning where our team member um, ran some stuff about strengths. And we just sort of cut try and keep learning together and um, we share our family stuff so we had our fizz, fizz pop baby um, and people's kids involved in picking things for our business so it's really important that you know we know everybody's not nine to five anymore that it's all we have lots of flexible workers so we want to try and encourage that part of their lives in as much as possible and then you know the stuff on the side is the dark time so <laughs> early mornings really awful clients and this believe it or not is an awful worst, client even though we were ever. dressed up <laughs> um, trying to keep our chins up up um, and uh, you know cancelled flights coming back and things like that so together we roll with it and I think that's really important when you're thinking about your culture and it's not just about people it's about you as well so that's about it from us we've got two more things to do I'm going to share with you quickly a video which talks a lot about leadership I'm pretty sure most people have seen it I've seen it about a billion times but I still love it and it's a really good reminder of what makes a culture or a movement it's about getting your first follower so those of you who are two or three people only this is a brilliant one to remind you that your first follower is really important if you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. <laughs> Cool. cool, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>